Prophet Muhammad draw the light. Prophet Muhammad enlighten the sight. Prophet Muhammad draw the light. Prophet Muhammad enlighten the sight. May peace be upon him. May peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad remove the dust. Remove the dust of unbelief. Prophet Muhammad brought us. Brought us a good relief. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlighten the sight. May peace be upon him. Alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah. Salatu salamu ala Rasulullah. Blessings and peace be on the Messenger of Allah, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome back to another episode of our series, More Than Honey and Black Seed. Uh, last time we were talking about physician liability. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an issue that, that, is, uh, that may make some physicians uncomfortable, but it is essential for the protection of the health of the people. And we talked about how Islam uh, laid down the foundation of this liability, accountability, and this can be extrapolated on to other professions as well, uh, as we indicated last time. I told you that we, this time we'll be talking about the history of authoring books on At-Tibbu and Nabawi, prophetic medicine. Now, uh, many of you may think that the, the, cons- the, 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 the term prophetic medicine is a very old term. Uh, well, it is a very old term, but it has not been known during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, not even at the time of the Sahaba or the Tabi'een, as a term, that, that particular term, prophetic medicine or atib and nabawi is a term that has actually been crafted much later than the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, Taba, Tabi'een. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the very early writings on prophetic uh, medicine uh, were, were not necessarily books that were singled out for prophetic medicine, uh, but rather uh, included in the hadith books. Uh, Al-Bukhari, Al-Tirmidhi, and Nasai, they have their own uh, book of tub, Kitab al tub, or the book of tub, or medicine, inside their hadith books, inside their hadith uh, collections. Uh, the earliest attempt to, uh, and, and, and certainly Abdul Malik ibn Habib al-Maliki al-Andalusi, uh, this great uh, Maliki uh, scholar from Andalusia, uh, was a contemporary of those collectors of hadith, those great collectors of hadith. He was a contemporary of them. He died in the year 238 after Hijra, and he authored a, uh, a smaller book on At-Tab al-Nabawi that has been, that, that he uh, actually titled as At-Tab al-Nabawi, that is the earliest uh, book that we could trace uh, back that, that is actually titled uh, At-Tab al-Nabawi by Abdul Malik ibn Habib al-Maliki al-Andalusi, uh, a Maliki scholar uh, from Andalusia, Abdul Malik ibn Habib. Uh, Around the time of Abdul Malik ibn Habib, I said the collectors of the books of Hadith, they also had uh, separate chapters within their books. They called them books because when a chapter gets to a certain size, uh, they, they used to call it book. The word book in Arabic anyway, kataba, uh, means gathered. Uh, it comes like katiba is a legion in the army, for instance, uh, because it's a gathering of soldiers. Uh, kitaba is a uh, gathering of letters and words and words in sentences and sentences and paragraphs and paragraphs and uh, chapters and so on and so forth. That's the concept of kitaba. It comes from the gathering. So uh, kitab al-tab means the, the, you know, a large gathering of uh, titles and subtitles that would deserve to be called kitab, that would deserve to be called kitab, even though it is, you know, uh, sort of, part of the uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, but it is big enough to, to be called kitab. Underneath the kitab, they would have the fasl, which is, uh, if you translate fasl now, it will be a chapter. Uh, that would be part of uh, the kitab or underneath the uh, title of kitab. Anyway, going back to the issue of uh, authoring on at tib al-Nabawi, we said during the time of the collectors of the sunnah, some of them, included uh, chapters, big chapters in their books uh, titled Kitab al-Tab or the Book of Madison. Uh, 
uh, but it was not a separate book. It was within the ha other hadith, uh, hadith uh, part of the collections. But Abdul Malik ibn Habib singled out uh, the, those uh, uh, reports, those athar that pertain to a tub in, in, in a book by themselves, and that's the earliest attempt at doing this. Then after Abdul Malik ibn Habib, there was a lapse of time where uh, no one wrote actually a, or singled out a book on the issue of uh, tub or medicine until Abu Bakr as Sunni, may Allah bestow mercy on him and may Allah bestow mercy on Abdul Malik ibn Habib and all of the scholars, until Abu Bakr ibn Sunni, may Allah bestow mercy on him, came. He died in the year 364 after Hijrah and uh, he wrote his book that he called uh At-tibbu fil hadith, tib in hadith, uh, or medicine in uh, hadith. And he did not call it uh, At-tib al nabawi So uh, the fact that he did not call it At-tib al nabawi also hints to us that the, the concept really was not really established, even though Abdul Malik ibn Habib was an, an earlier uh, scholar, but the, 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 the term itself was not really uh, a popular term. Uh, was not standardized uh, up until that uh, point. So he called it At-Tab fi uh, al-Hadith. Uh, then came uh, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Hasan al-Harrani, who died in the year 369 after uh, Hijrah, and he wrote uh, a book that he named At-Tab al-Nabawi. So back to the term At-Tab al-Nabawi now back to the, the term Al-Tab al nabawi or prophetic medicine. Abu Ubaid ibn Hassan al-Harrani, who died in 369, wrote that book, Al-Tab uh, al nabawi uh, After Abu Ubaid ibn Hassan al-Harrani came uh, many scholars that started to write books which they named Al-Tab al nabawi uh, Most of them, at least, named them Al-Tab al nabawi We have Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani, who died in the year 430, after Hijrah, and uh, between Abu Ubaid, uh, uh, between Abu Naim al-Asbahani, and uh, the next one, the on your list here, which is uh, Muwaffaq uh, Din uh, Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi, uh, there were actually a couple of scholars who wrote books on, or authored books on uh, Al-Tab al-Nabawi, Abu al-Qasim al-Naysaburi uh, is, is uh, one of them, Abu uh, Abbas al-Mustaghfari, is, is, is also another one of them. Uh, but then came Muwafaq al-Din Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi, and he was, uh, you know, he was a scholar and a physician at the same time. Uh, by the way, Imam al-Shafai was also uh, a medical practitioner to a great extent. Uh, Imam ibn al-Qayyim was also a medical practitioner uh, to a great extent. So the, the faqih physician uh, combination is not really new in the history of Islam. It's very old. Uh, most of our scholars in the past, they do, they did have some, uh, professions on the side. Uh, certainly, Shafai did not make money out of this profession, uh, but, but they, they did have some other skills, uh, and they did have professions, uh, but not necessarily Shafai, uh, taking medicine as, as a profession. So, uh, Muafakadin al-Baghdadi, had you know the skill, the medical skill, and he was also a scholar. And then came after Muwaffaq al-Din al-Baghdadi, uh, someone who really, uh, he, who's, who's really central to this whole uh, hi history of uh, writing on uh, prophetic medicine. He's he's usually not very uh, he's he's not very popular as a scholar. That's why his contribution is not mentioned that. Frequently, but Ala Adin al Kahal, uh, Ala Adin al Kahal came actually before Ibn al Qayyim and al Zahabi. Uh, Ibn al Qayyim and al Zahabi, each one of them wrote a book on al Tab al Nabawi and they called it al Tab al Nabawi. Uh, but Ala Adin al Kahal came before uh, the two of them. He actually died in the year uh, 620 after uh, Hijrah, and he, uh, or I'm sorry, so 720 after Hijrah. And he uh, wrote a very um, uh, detailed book on Atab al Nabawi. If you compare his, uh, uh, you know, uh, death uh, day or the date of his death to Ibn Qayyim, Imam Ibn Qayyim, may Allah bestow mercy on him, and Imam Zahabi, may Allah 
uh, bestow mercy on him, you'll find that Imam ibn Qayyim died uh, in the year 751 after Hijrah, and Imam al-Zahabi died in the year uh, 748 after Hijrah, or around that time. So they were, uh, they came later. So Allah al-Din al-Kahal preceded them, and he wrote a detailed book on Atab al nabawi In fact, Imam ibn Qayyim and Imam al-Zahabi, they do take from uh, Allah al-Din al-Kahal's uh, book. Uh, so Imam Ibn Qayyim and Imam Al-Zahabi, they each wrote a book on Atab al-Nabawi. Uh, now, you have books written, but Imam Ibn Qayyim's book actually is, is, is actually part of his book, Zad al-Ma'ad fi Haydi Khayr al-Ibad. So he did not necessarily single this out by, you know, a, a separate book, but it was part of his book, but that part was big enough to be called a book. Uh, it was certainly, it's certainly a book. Uh, so it's a big part. Uh, the fact that an Imam al Qayyim and an Imam al Zahabi are who they are, they're huge, certainly. Uh, they're great Imams, uh, they're well grounded in knowledge, uh, and in the history of Islam, they are of the most uh, uh, prominent ones. Uh, the fact that they authored books on Al Tabb al Nabawi gave, uh, gave the topic itself. Uh, a lot of steam, a lot of strength, a lot of credibility, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Both the Imam Ibn Qayyim and Imam al-Zahabi are of the opinion that the Prophet ﷺ was infallible uh, in uh, all areas, including uh, matters of uh, the, the life of this world, uh, and they, they both considered Atab al-Nabawi to be actually uh, part of the uh, revelation, so they were they, they, they had strong feelings uh, about the issue. And then came uh, uh, actually b- before Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti. The next one that will show on your list here is Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, who died in the year 9-11 after Hijrah. Uh, but before Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, Imam al-Sakhawi also wrote a book uh, between <coughs> between Ibn Qayyim and Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti. Imam al-Sakhawi wrote a book on Atab. Uh, and Nabawi. Uh, but now you have, uh, great imams now. You have like heavyweights now. You have Ibn al-Qayyim, you have a Zahabi, you have a Suyuti. Uh, you, also, also Imam Sakhawi was a great imam. Uh, but, uh, Suyuti, a Zahabi, Ibn al-Qayyim, uh, heavyweights and writing on the issue of Atab al-Nabawi, uh, having, uh, such feelings, uh, for, uh, the, the al nabawi uh, that certainly gave a lot of steam, a lot of strength, uh, to the, and a lot of credibility uh, to the topic. And uh, the topic was revived sort of in, in, in terms of writing and authoring and so on and so forth in our modern times. But we will uh, have a little bit to say about our modern times when we come back from uh, the break, in, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So see you then. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. La ida dak dukka ida dukka til arda kadak dakkan. Do you want to learn how to recite the Quran? Do you want to read Islamic books in Arabic? You may enroll in a small group. Al-Asal min al-Suqi. Ishtara. Naam, ishtara. A private lesson. Man mithluha fi fadliha. Man mithluha fi fadliha. Or at your own pace to fit your schedule. Hal anta qabirun fi al-ma'adi? Courses for sisters with female instructors. We're bringing you the latest software technology professional instructors, and a state-of-the-art classroom to the comfort of your home. Enroll now in Huda Academy. Huda Academy, your gateway to authentic Islamic knowledge. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Alhamdulillah, welcome back. Uh, now we will talk about the modern times and the, the revival of the concept of a Tabbi Nabawi in, in modern times. Um, 
Uh, we may need to have some detailed discussion on the issue of Tab al-Nabawi and the uh, difference of opinion regarding the infallibility of the Prophet Sallallahu in that particular area, uh, which is the area of a tub, which is the area of science in general, or the sciences of this world, uh, and and the, the profes- various prof- professions such as agriculture, engineering, medicine, war, war tactics, etc., etc. Uh, but before we do this, uh, I, I want to say that the the fact that there are a lot of people talking about tub and nabawi nowadays. Um, they may not have, they may not have the knowledge of Ibn al-Qayyim and al-Zahabi. I said that Ibn al-Qayyim and al-Zahabi had passion for the topic. And Ibn al-Qayyim and al-Zahabi, may Allah bestow mercy on both of them and the rest of our Muslim scholars, uh, and preserve those who are, who are alive. They, uh, uh, they had the, the knowledge of the deen that is sufficient that will protect them from uh, deviation that will protect them from, from abuse of Atab al-Nabawi. Whether or not their position on the infallibility of the Prophet regarding medical issues, and we will talk about this, uh, you know, disagreement, uh, b- between the scholars in, in more detail, maybe in the next episode, inshallah, God willing. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that the list of scholars that we have mentioned, uh, the list of scholars that uh, you you have seen that authored books on at tab al-Nabawi, uh, th- these were scholars, these were great scholars, uh, particularly people of the weight of Suyuti and uh, Ibn al-Qayyim uh, and uh, al-Zahabi. Suyuti had a little bit of a different position from Ibn al-Qayyim and al-Zahabi when it comes to, to, this, to this issue. Uh, but Ibn al-Qayyim and al-Zahabi, uh, that they clearly had the position that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, infallible. Nowadays, if uh, if you have a lot of people talking about the issue of Atab al-Nabawi and they don't know much about the Nabawi part of it, which is prophetic, which is the, the sciences of, uh, of the Sharia, the different disciplines of uh, Sharia uh, sciences, they don't know much about the uh the the disciplines that will provide them with tools uh to have a good understanding such as the language and grammar rhetoric uh etc usul al fiqh fundamentals of jurisprudence usul al hadith uh, uh fundamentals of hadith and hadith terminology and uh the uh, ways of uh, interpretation and so on and so forth so they don't have the tools they don't also know much they don't have comprehensive knowledge of the sunnah and the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and on the other side also they are not physicians um and i'm not i'm not talking about you know, we have to be very very careful here i'm not talking about each and every one who talks about this issue I'm talking about the presence of a subset of uh, speakers who talk about Atab al-Nabawi or who actually practice Atab al-Nabawi. They have clinics where they practice uh, Atab al-Nabawi and they may not know much about the prophetic side of it and they may not know either much about the medical side of it. So neither Atab nor al-Nabawi. So they are not physicians, uh, and they are not scholars. Sometimes, uh, if the, they may be physicians, sometimes they could be physicians. But physicians does not mean, uh, does not mean that they are actually experts, uh, in, in medicine. You know, to graduate from medical school does not mean that you are an expert, uh, that you, that you have, you know, Credibility uh, as a, a medical scientist. There is a difference between a physician who knows how to treat certain diseases and a medical scientist that is an expert that is, uh, that has, uh, credibility for his statements that are founded on correct premises. Correct premises. Now, Islam is an evidence-based religion. We do know that. Islam is an evidence-based religion. And Islam teaches us to be evidence-based not only with regard to the matters of the deen, but also with regard to the matters of the dunya. Uh, 
uh, things need to be proven through studies. And uh, the least or the weakest uh, type of evidence in medicine is the so-called expert opinion, is the so-called expert opinion. Uh, which expert opinion is the weakest uh, uh, evidence? The expert opinion that is founded on correct premises is a very weak evidence, but the expert opinion that is not founded on correct premises uh, is, not an, uh, is not evidence at all, weak or strong. It's not evidence. Also, the opinion of someone who is not expert, who has not been known. Remember the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who he, we mentioned this hadith in the last episode, reported by Abi Dawood from Abu bin Shaib, from his father, from his grandfather. Whoever practices medicine and has not been known for it shall be liable. Man tatabba lam yu'lam minhu tib, fahuwa damin. So to say expert, the person needs to be really known for this as a medical scientist. Not every physician is a medical scientist whose opinions are expert opinions. Uh, therefore, uh, I, I think that we, we ought to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regard to this uh, issue of al-Tabb al-Nabawi. This issue needs to be addressed by people who are scholarly, uh, if they want to address it from uh, an Islamic juridical, uh, legal, uh, theological uh, angle, uh, or people who are expert physicians, if they want to address it from a uh, from from the other angle, which is the angle of uh, uh, medicine. If if uh, if you have people who do not have strength on either side uh, and they they write on al tabb al nabawi, uh, then you should really be very uncomfortable about what they write. Uh, they need to be known amongst the so need to be known amongst the medical experts as medical experts. They need to be known amongst the scholars as scholars. So if they are not known amongst the scholars as scholars and amongst the medical experts as medical experts, it would make one very uncomfortable uh, uh, sort of uh, giving credit to their positions and their claims, particularly when uh, personal interest is involved, particularly, particularly when they have a stake in the matter, uh, such as when they... They have their own practices uh, where they claim to be practicing uh, prophetic uh, medicine. Now, uh, in the next episode, we will be talking about the, the issue of prophetic medicine with regard to the, 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 the disagreement over the infallibility of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, but before we get there, is it prophetic medicine? or medicine of the Prophet. Remember from the very first uh, episode that we were talking about this issue, I kept on saying prophetic medicine, at-tabbun nabawi, or the medicine of the Prophet, tabbun nabi, or you could say also tabbun rasul, the medicine of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reason why I mentioned the two uh, terms all the time is not to sort of end the disagreement by choosing a term. Because if you choose the prophetic medicine, then you're saying that this is actually part of the revelation, part of the role of the Prophet ﷺ is to teach us about medicine, and this is prophetic medicine. Uh, if you say it is the medicine of the Prophet, so it is the medicine that was practiced or prescribed by uh, the Prophet ﷺ, and it doesn't have that connotation. When we come back in the next episode, inshallah, God willing, we will talk more about it, whether it is prophetic medicine or the medicine of the Prophet, at tabb al nabawi or tabb al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And until that time, um, uh, enjoy the favors and blessings of Allah on you. And remember to make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and send your blessings and prayers. Uh, unto him who uh, conveyed all that good uh, to us that is uh, essential for the preservation and promotion of our health. See you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight.
May peace be upon him. May peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad removed the dust. Removed the dust of unbelief. Prophet Muhammad brought us. Brought us a good relief. May peace be upon him. May peace be upon him. Mm-hmm.